Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 8th Annual Music Business Forum. Again, my name is AJ Merlino. I'm the Director of Music Industry Studies and the Associate Dean at Albright College. I'm really happy to introduce the pr first presentation that we have in the afternoon, Jenna Olivo. Originally from New Jersey, Jenna is a 2013 graduate of Albright College, where she doubled major in business administration and marketing and minored in music business. Post-graduation, she moved to Nashville, Tennessee after landing an internship with Digital Marketing Department at the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. After stops at both Broadcast Music Inc. and Universal Music Publishing Group, she now has been part of the Warner Music Group family for the past two years. Outside of the office, you can find her on one of Nashville's many hiking trails, volunteering at the Country Music Hall of Fame, or at Nashville's Music Cares and Ambassadors. Please help me welcome Jenna. Hi everybody, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't be at Albright and I was really excited for that as it would have been my first time back on campus after graduating. Um, but here we are and I'm glad that we were able to make this happen uh, virtually. First, I thought I would start out um, with a little bit of my background and basically how I got to be where I am today. Um, as AJ mentioned, I graduated in May of 2013 um, from Albright, and I moved to Nashville in September of 2013 for an unpaid internship um, at the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. I originally had, I had two internships. My first internship was in the development department, and then my second internship was in the digital marketing department. Um, from there, I moved to a part-time job uh, at BMI, and I was working there four days a week, while also working at the Ryman Auditorium, doing artist merch, and working in the gift shop. Eventually, after almost two years at BMI, I decided to leave for a full-time job in marketing. After I worked in marketing for two years, I switched back into music, working at Universal Music Publishing Group, and then Warner Music Group. Um, my internships at the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum were great, um, although unpaid. I know not everybody can um, afford to do an unpaid internship, but luckily I had family um, in the Nashville area that I was able to live with while I did this. Uh, my first internship was in the development department and I assisted the development team with executing events for the museum's top donors and sponsors. Basically, every time there was a new exhibit, let's say it was a Casey Musgraves exhibit, um, we would invite all of the top guests and people that helped sponsor the exhibit and the museum to see the exhibit before it opened to the public. Um, I also got a cool opportunity to work at the 20 13 medallion ceremony, which is basically like a hall of fame induction. Um, and there's usually three artists each year that are chosen for that. Um, from there, I moved on to the digital marketing department where I was in charge of composing and scheduling all of the posts for all of their social media platforms. And around this time, the museum was revamping their website. So I got to assist with some HTML and edit a few pages of that. Then I moved on to um, BMI where I was there for two years. Originally I was a business development specialist where I worked in essentially it was a call center. Um, I don't know if you've been to like bars or restaurants when you're walking in the door there's like a sticker that says music licensed by BMI or music licensed by ASCAP or CSAC. Um, that basically means that they're already paying for a music license if they have, um, let's say, karaoke, live music, um, a DJ, trivia. Uh, so part of my job was to call bars, restaurants, clubs, even hotels, ski resorts, all sorts of places where there could possibly be music use. And we would ask them like, oh, do you have any live music on this day? Is there a cover charge and things like that? And we had a list in our system of places where we knew they had live music use, but they were not paying for a license. So our job was to generate leads um, that were then sent on to the sales department, and then the sales department would call and sell the music license. From there, I moved on to the customer relations department, where I 
helped follow up on these leads and we would call and double check on owners and if they needed to renew their license and stuff like that. Um, after being at BMI for two years, as I mentioned, I moved back to marketing um, for two years. And I did that because I felt like my marketing experience that I had was super outdated. The only marketing experience I had was um, from college internships. And at that time, I was thinking that I wanted to work in the music industry within the marketing, some, something in marketing, I wasn't sure. And I felt like if I was applying for jobs, they wouldn't necessarily pick me for an interview because I wasn't doing anything in marketing. So I did that for two years until this position at Universal Music Publishing Group kind of fell into my lap. Um, this was in the global data services department. So basically, we worked with all of the global offices um, that we had, and we would get statements in. There were some of, sometimes they're manual and handwritten. Other times they were um, large Excel documents. I think I worked on one that had a million lines, which is insane. And we had to use pretty high level Excel skills, uh, pivot tables, um, a lot of formulas to reformat them so that we could um, upload them into our system. Our system only was able to recognize um, US dollars. So if we were getting something from China or um, England, it, everything had to be converted. Um, I only did this for like seven to eight months, and then I moved on to Warner, where I've been for two years today. So at Warner, currently I am the senior contracts administrator in the reporting administration department. What that means is that my department is responsible for entering all of the artist recording agreements into our royalty system. So after the artist signs with the label, we get sent that recording contract, which I will go into on another slide. In addition to entering in the recording agreements, I also um, am in charge of new releases. Um, so we'll get like calendar updates with a release that's coming out, let's say in two weeks. And our job is to make sure that before that's released, we have everything in the system to make sure that it's gonna calculate correctly. Let's see, I think I have a question coming. Oh, I'm going to answer this one towards the end, if you guys don't mind. Move on to the next slide. So I was able to um, get approval to show you guys what an actual recording agreement looks like. So just pardon the um, black lines. I had to um, black out some confidential information. So this is like what the first page of the recording agreement would look like. Here, this would have the date, and usually where it says between, it would have the company name. So it could say Warner Music Group, it could say Universal Music Group, Atlantic, whatever. And then the artist uh, name. And if it's a band, it'll have the band name up here, and then it'll say PKA, and it'll list all of the band members after that. So this is the first page, and it just, just basically discusses that it's an exclusive service between the company and the artist, and then they'll go into the term, which is down here. So the term could be just an initial period, which is later on defined. An initial period could be one LP, it could be an EP, whatever the artist and business affairs is able to negotiate. And then you have something called option periods. So the uh, term could be an initial period plus four option periods, which could be another three, four, LPs, EPs, et cetera. Um, so basically this is just clarifying what it said on the first page. An initial period they're saying is going to be LP1, the first option period, LP2, and so on. The next section that my department focuses on is the recording procedure, which this will basically kind of just summarize what they're expecting. But down here, it says that there's gonna be 11 masters and it's gonna be a total of 40 minutes of music. Purchase recordings are another thing that can be negotiated. Not every artist that signs with the label will have previous recordings that they're coming into with. Um, let's say 
we find an artist from SoundCloud and we want to sign that artist and they've already released music on their own. The label can negotiate um, and buy those recordings that they've already released. And then um, in the agreement, it'll either say the purchase recordings are part of the recording agreement, part of the initial period, LP1, LP2, or they're not included in that term, but we're still purchasing them separately. This is another section that we focus on and it's called creative and marketing matters. And this section will discuss um, joint records, compilations, um, mid price and budget records. The mid price and the budget is what I focus on specifically as we need to in, um, input that into our royalty system. And I don't know if you guys have um, discussed that at all, but basically it's the mid price is um, discussing when usually there's like a term of like 12 months, maybe 18 months of when um, the record can be discounted to sell. And the same thing with the budget. So let's say an album releases tomorrow. And in this agreement, it says that we can adjust the price within 12 months. So in stores, it can be discounted. We have a section with advances. Um, my department doesn't really focus on the advances and the recording costs so much as um, kind of like a and administration in New York that we deal with. They focus on this section. Um, when we create an account, there needs to be an account created for them to book the costs. And a lot of times the advances get booked first for obvious reasons. The producer services, usually in the recording contract, it's kind of just vague. Um, we'll get separate agreements for each producer, especially if there's a different producer for each track. Again, um, my department doesn't deal with this section as much. Um, artist royalties will deal with that because they need to create separate accounts in their system under the artist account. So you have an artist account, which we call head office accounts, and then we have branch accounts, which would be for the producers and for all of the track costs. Now the royalty section is what my department cares most about, and we need to be able to have all of this information in order to set up an account correctly. Um, a lot of times business affairs will use a template agreement for each artist. So if you're not reading the whole agreement carefully, you can find mistakes that need to be clarified before we can go ahead and set up the agreement. Um, I forgot to mention that anything that is in cap that is capitalized or bolded and underlined, it will be defined in the definition section, um, which I will also show you later. So if you are reading and you don't know what something means, you just flip all the way to the end and there's a section uh, that has everything defined. Um, so for this one, they're showing EPs would get a, a different rate. Sometimes singles and EPs have the same rate. It kind of just depends what's negotiated. Here, they're also saying that the initial period and the first and second option period are all getting the same rate, while the third and fourth option periods are getting a different rate. Now you have escalations, which escalations you can have a different rate if an album sells a certain number of units. It could be 100,000 units, it could be 400,000 units, it kind of just depends on what's negotiated. Usually we'll see like 4, 400,000 units and then like maybe uh, 1 million, 1.2 million units here, it kind, of, it kind of depends. And the escalation rates, so if, let's see, on the initial first and second option period, let's say they're getting 16% of the basic US rate. The escalation, it'll typically, it'll be 16.5% um, here, and then 17% here. They usually increase by um, a half percentage, although I have seen some that have increased by a full 1%. It just depends on the agreement. Now we have different territories. Um, so again, when you're reading the agreement, usually in the first section, it'll have um, territory and it'll say universe, which is the whole world. 
Again, you can also go to the definition and look for the territory. That depends on how we set things up in the system. So it could be an Australian artist, which would be getting a different rate than they would be getting in the United States. Um, so usually down here where it says rest of world in our system, we would put like world X, US and Australia, just so we know that the computer can make that determination between the different rates. Um, this, I'm not exactly sure how they come up with what territories are getting what. I assume it probably has to do with marketing and what in um, what countries the artist is performing better. Um, I especially know if we get an Australian or a Canadian artist, usually that's listed on here. Um, but sometimes it just seems very, very random and we just, I personally don't know how they come up with um, this. Next, the royalty section continued. We input the club rate, we input um, the TV campaign language. We don't really do that here in the United States, but in other countries like uh, Europe, um, Australia, they run TV commercials for either the artist tour or the artist album. Um, for instance, like I'm trying to think of one that I can use, like Michael Buble. I've seen a Michael Buble commercial on TV before. Um, so in this section where it says the TV campaign, that's the section that we need to look at. And then we have a TV campaign section in our online royalty system, which I unfortunately can't show, um, which is kind of a bummer, but a lot of it is confidential information. Down here, we get into club records and streaming language. Oh, sorry. Let me go to, so this is what the whole page of the recording and the recording agreement will look like. And I kind of just want you to see how lengthy it is. See how this is bold and underlined. That is a definition that we can see later on. This is actually a shorter agreement. It's only 38 pages. I've had to read agreements that are 50 pages, 100 pages. Sometimes they get um, pretty confusing, but this section is the main section that I typically have to look for. And if it's not included in that section, I have seen it included in other sections. So you really do have to read the whole agreement. I want to get to the bottom. So this agreement that I have is actually an artist that is under the age of 18. So there's a special clause in here for a minor, which is sometimes interesting to read. Let's see. Here. So it's the guardian's um, guarantee. Basic, they have the parent or guardian has to sign the agreement in addition to the artist. And it's basically the parent or guardian stating that they understand everything um, and then they sign it as well. Um, I've actually seen some agreements that have a tutoring section if the artist is underage. Sometimes they'll write into the agreement that they will travel with a tutor or um, do online school, whatever the agreement is that they um, decide. Um, This is the definitions, which is, is very helpful even for me because depending on the business affairs executive that wrote the agreement, they can have different definitions. Um, most of the time it can be pretty straightforward, um, but you never know. This corner here that I blacked out is the initials of the person who wrote the agreement. So if you do have any problems, that would be the person that I would go to for questions because sometimes it's not clear. Um, but a lot of these, like you can find in textbooks, like this is just basically explaining what a budget record is. Um, let me scroll down so you can see the territory. So this is, it says territory of the universe, but sometimes it could say, um, the United States and Australia, or United States and Canada, um, or it could say European Union. And sometimes we might not know what that means. If European Union is not defined in this agreement, we could go on Google and look up what is included in that, but that's not always super accurate. So 
a lot of times we'll just have to email um, business affairs and see if they can clarify anything. Um, let me see if there's some questions. Um, you worked both, you worked in both the licensing and marketing departments in the music industry, doing general licensing, licensing at BMI and a marketing and sales coordinator at Blink Marketing. Can you compare and contrast these fields? And from your experience in these fields, what do you think are the best qualities for an individual to have to thrive? Um, so actually, Blink Marketing wasn't in the music industry. It was in the promotional products industry, um, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, basically, if you're going to, let's say, a concert or a sporting event or anything where you get like a freebie, whether it be a pen, a shirt, a backpack with a logo on it, that was something that my company would do. Um, we produce promotional products, but while I worked there, I also ran their social media pages and separate marketing campaigns, Google AdWords and that sort of thing. And at the time I thought I would want to do that, um, but just in music. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to do that yet, so I can't really speak on whether or not I would still be interested in doing that for music. But right now I do like where I am in royalties. Um, the general licensing aspect of BMI was great, but also I learned that that wasn't for me. Um, since I've worked in licensing, publishing, and now um, royalties, I can definitely say that I liked the publishing and the artist royalties aspect more. Um, let's see what else. How did working at how do working at BMI differ from working at the Country Music Hall of Fame? Was one experience better than the other or were they incomparable? Um, they were two very different environments. One, BMI was more corporate um, and the Country Music Hall of Fame was very relaxed. Uh, and as an intern, I kind of got to work on a bunch of different projects that I probably wouldn't have been able to do if I was employed there. Uh, I worked on two separate departments, the development and fundraising department, and then the marketing, uh, digital marketing web stuff. Uh, so it's kind of hard to compare just because they're so different, but that's why I like internships because you can get different experience in different industries just to see what you like, what you wanna pursue and what you don't like at all. Um, let's see. Is the artist involved in making these types of decisions or is everything decided on their behalf? Uh, I'm honestly not sure. I would assume the artist would be in these meetings as the agreement is being drafted, um, but obviously they have a lawyer that is representing them as well. So the lawyer that they have isn't going to make a decision that isn't in the artist's favor. During the negotiation periods of the agreement, if there are any large discussions that would make you go back and completely redo a section of the agreement. Um, I've never been in a negotiation, but I do know that there are sometimes what we call amendments that come in. So we'll get the original agreement and then oftentimes a day or two later, a week, sometimes even a year, we could get an amendment, which would basically be altering a section of the previous agreement that we have. And that amendment will say, uh, it'll reference in bold and underline uh, the date of the previous agreement that we have. Um, let's see. What happens if an artist undersells what they initially expected? Um, honestly, I'm not sure as basically anything that happens after my department I don't handle anything with sales. I don't handle anything with streaming numbers or album counts, anything like that. Our sole purpose is to make sure that the rates are gonna calculate in the system when the artist releases music. It moves onto the, um, the artist royalties team and that person that has that account is in charge of linking all of the tracks to the, to the account that we have in our system. Um, let's see. 
was there a penalty imposed or a fee the owners had to pay if their license wasn't renewed or expired? I'm assuming that question is in um, relation to BMI and yes, a lot of times the owners of bars and restaurants, they know that they have to pay a license and they don't wanna pay it because it's expensive. But what they also don't know is that there are people whose jobs it is, is to go into these businesses and sit there and record the music usage. And if a certain percentage of the music that's being played is a BMI artist, is BMI in the BMI catalog, then they can get fined for each song that they play. Sometimes you'll see um, stories in the newspaper of a bar or a restaurant being fined in like six, uh, six figures for something like this. Um, Based on your internship experience, what would you say you have learned that you use and experience every day in your work life and have applied to your personal life? Um, let's see. Well, my internships at the Country Music Hall of Fame kind of required me to be more outgoing than I was going into it. I had to interact and talk with a lot of high level executives and that was my first time uh, doing so. So it kind of brought me out of my shell a little bit. And now I remember that experience and I use it um, at networking events. It did take me longer than it probably should have to go to networking events, but now I know how important they are. So that is something I highly recommend. You can even go to networking events um, while you're a student. You don't have to be in the workforce to do that. And you never know who you're gonna meet there. So go prepared with business cards. But also I've learned I would never flat out ask for a job from these from these events, but you can ask like, oh, do you want to meet for coffee? I'd love to hear more about what you do. And that always seems to go over pretty well. Um, let's see. Important adult life question. Does the company you work for offer insurance and benefits or do you have to purchase it yourself? I know in most corporate industries they do, however, I don't know about the music industry. So that's a good question. Um, with my company, uh, Warner Music Group and at Universal, they did have health insurance um, and they do, they do pay for it. Um, but a small portion comes out of my paychecks. But if you are a musician or a songwriter and you don't work for a company like this, you will have to purchase your own health insurance. Uh, which is why I'm involved in an organization called Music Cares, which um, is an organization that basically provides aid for anybody in the music industry that's in a financial crisis. So a lot of times uh, self-employed musicians, songwriters, touring people can get insurance through them, through the Music Health Alliance, or they can get some sort of stipend. Um, have you met any country artists while working at the Country Music Hall of Fame? Uh, I didn't officially meet anybody, but I did get to ride an elevator with Kenny Rogers once, and that was pretty cool. Um, let's see. Given that you had a few other jobs, what experiences do you think helped you the most to get you where you are? Um, I think that because I've had a few other jobs, it's helped me just get the job that I have. Um, a lot of people in my office are actually fresh out of college, um, but my boss was looking for somebody that had a little bit more experience. Uh, I didn't necessarily have experience reading contracts, but that's something that they can teach. Um, so as long as I feel like you're willing to work and put in the time and effort, that kind of goes a long way. Um, let's see what else. People tend to think that you have to enjoy country music to thrive in Nashville. What are your thoughts? Um, yes, country music is pretty much everywhere in Nashville, but that's not the only music scene that's here. Um, we have a lot of uh, like pop punk bands. We have a lot of indie. Um, we have a lot of Americana. There's a lot of um, different venues for different genres. Uh, so you don't just have to enjoy country music to live in Nashville. Um, 
What is your favorite memory from your time as a student at Albright? So when I was a student at Albright, the music industry uh, studies wasn't a major, it was only a minor, and we didn't have really any resources that you guys have today. Um, so this is pretty cool that you have a forum to um, learn and ask questions, but I would have to say that my favorite memory is, I went on two alternative spring break trips and those were pretty fun. Um, what was your favorite task you got to partake in during your time at the Hall of Fame? So my one of my favorite things was helping to plan the Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which they call the medallion ceremony. Um, and I actually got to attend that and just, I think Kenny Rogers was being inducted when I was there. So that was just cool to watch and probably a once in a lifetime opportunity because you can't buy tickets to an event like that. Um, would you say that Albright really helped prepare you for your career? I would say yes, um, because I had such a wide variety of interests. And since I did double major in marketing and business administration, and minored in music business. It's kind of just a broad um, knowledge that I took with me to different areas of my um, work. How did you find out about networking events while you were still a student? LinkedIn, I was on LinkedIn in high school. I am on LinkedIn every day now, even though I'm not currently looking for a job. There are a lot of different groups that you can join based on your interest. There's marketing groups, there's a lot of music groups and people in there are always posting about different events or they have different websites that you can go to just to brush up on certain skills. Um, I actually just did like a free online class um, last week because I'm home working from home and I needed something to do and this kind of brushed me up on more of the music law and ethics side of things that hopefully will help me out in my day-to-day -day job. Um, but networking outside of my job in Nashville, at least, we have a lot of networking groups. I'm in the Women's Music Business Association, and that is a group every month. All of the women that work in music in Nashville come together and meet, and they'll usually be a speaker, and you can learn about that person and what they do in the industry and you can ask questions there. And I've met a lot of great people there. Um, there's Women in Music in Nashville. We have Solid. Um, we have a lot of different organizations that you, can, that you can meet a lot of people at in Nashville. And even just by going to um, concerts and events in town, as Brianna mentioned, um, you can meet a lot of people that way. I've gone to a lot of shows. A lot of shows are free. I've gone to a lot. And once you keep going, you see the same people at each show. Um, how would you stay updated with all of the new changes that occur within marketing or any other department within the business? So marketing wise, I'm kind of an early adopter with certain technologies. Like I was on Twitter before it was big. I was using it in high school when nobody was really on it. And that's something that people use every day. Um, I kind of also always plugged in, which is both good and bad. So marketing wise, um, just kind of always be looking out for the next platform and play, play around with it. Um, with my marketing job, like I, if you're asked to do something and you don't know how to do it, I always just said yes. And then I would Google it or go on YouTube and learn how to do it because I wanted them to know that I could that I could do whatever was asked of me. Um, as for any other department within, oh, it went up there. Oh, it said it, we're going to answer it live. Okay. How has living in Nashville impacted your opportunities within the music industry? So obviously Nashville is a big um, music town. Um, we have two big music, uh, two colleges that have huge music programs, uh, MTSU and Belmont. A lot of my office in Nashville has a lot of Belmont, um, like a lot of students right from Belmont that have just graduated. Um, but I think I was able to get my job because I didn't go to Belmont and I had a different 
background, different experience than a lot of the Belmont students. Um, what would you say is the most difficult part when dealing with these different contracts? A lot of times the business affairs executives that write these agreements don't know how they'll be set up in our system. They don't know what our system can handle. So sometimes we'll be reading something and trying to set something up and it's just not possible. So we'll have to go back and forth with business affairs to see what can be changed or just kind of to clarify how it should be set up. Um, the system is old and they actually are looking to have a new system that hopefully will be more up to date. Um, so hopefully that happens, but until then we have to manually input everything. Um, if you could branch into other areas of the music industry, what would you pursue? Um, well, I always thought that I wanted to work at BMI, um, and I did work there, and it wasn't for me. Um, but that's not to say that all of BMI isn't for me. It's just I didn't enjoy the call center aspect that I was in. I think I would like to eventually work more directly with songwriters as um, maybe like a song plugger. But again, I don't have experience in that um, area. Uh, but for me, that would be fun because part of living in Nashville, I go to a lot of writers rounds um, and I get to see these songwriters perform their songs. And then like four years later, I hear it on the radio sung by Laura George Line or whoever. But, um, that, that that area is cool to me. Um, where do you so see yourself in three years? <laughs> That's always a question that makes me laugh in job interviews because I moved to Nashville for a temporary internship and here I am almost seven years later, still, still here. Um, so I don't know. I hopefully, I would like to stay at Warner for a long time. Um, I've never stayed at a job longer than two years, uh, so I would like to have some tenure at Warner, um, whether it's in my department or not. Um, when you said that the royalty rate negotiated for the artist under the different album tier rates are 16.5% of the U.S. rate, does that mean the artist would only get 165 percent of the 9.1 cents per song sold? Um, that's a good question and I think it depends. I don't really know if I'm the best person to answer that, but I can try and get some more information before the panel. Um, I'll come back to you on that. And what advice would you give for the first week on the job? Um, read literally every manual they give you. Um, my first week at Warner, my boss actually wasn't there and I was alone. And I basically just read every manual that they gave me for every system. I read every book that they gave me. And so when they came back, I was prepared and able to have a list of questions and ask them what I didn't understand and kind of just jump right in to work. Okay, I think that was the last question. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jenna. Um, mm -hmm. Round of applause digitally for Jenna, everybody. Um, we're going to take a, a quick break. We'll get Paul Sinclair on the line, and I'll rejoin you at around 2 o'clock. Thanks, Jenna.